Mark Ten Bosch is trying to do something that I don't think anybody else in history has tried to do, which is to design a spatial, a deep spatial puzzle game that takes place in four spatial, uh, spatial dimensions. So his game uh, called uh, Miega Kure is, am I pronouncing that right? Is that all right? Um, it's still a work in progress, and it's still deeply uh, shrouded in mystery, much like uh, Mark himself. Uh, <laughs> But another person who's deeply shrouded in mystery, uh, Jonathan Blow, has already called it uh, one of the great puzzle games of all time. Um, at practice, uh, what we do is we ask speakers to share their design process. And you know, I'm really excited to hear about the design process for this game because you know, it, it seems like you know, it's, a very, it's, a very difficult, it's a very difficult challenge. Mark set himself a very difficult challenge. You know, how do you design uh, a, a puzzle in a space that you can't visualize? How do you design a puzzle uh, in, in a space you can't reason intuitively about? Um, so, you know, this is one of, uh, this is probably the number one game that I'm most excited for in the world right now, and I'm also really excited uh, to hear this talk. Uh, Mark Tenbosch. Hello. Okay. So this is my talk. Is the mic okay? Yeah. Um, it's called Exploring and Presenting a Game's Consequence Space, uh, aka how do you find out what is cool about a 4D game and how do you make it so people can understand. Um, so Migakure is a 4D game. Bennett talked a little bit about it. Uh, you know what a 2D game is. You can only move in two directions. You know what a 3D game is. You can only move in three directions. So what is a 4D game when in a 4D game you can move in four directions? Uh, and I'm not talking about time here. It's just like one more dimension of space. Uh, and so computers don't care how many dimensions they are. They're just storing one number per dimension. So we just have to find a way to display them, essentially. Um, and this uh, diagram at the beginning kind of shows this idea where like you take a point, you move it, uh, find the space that it creates, it creates a line, and you can do that again, it makes a square. Do this again in one more dimension, perpendicular to the first two, you get a cube, and if you do this in, a, in another time, then you get a hypercube, a 4D cube. Uh, and I'll talk more about what the game is in a second, because uh, you kind of have to know what it you know, how it works. So this is what it looks like. If you've already seen the trailer, I'm sorry, I'm gonna like go through this again. Um, but so I'm gonna talk about like one thing that you could do if you could move in four dimensions. So if you have this wall and you can't go around it and you can't jump over it, but um, if you could move in 4D, you could go around it in the fourth dimension. So that's kind of what it looks like. And then you're in this parallel world where the wall is gone and it's just rubble instead. So I have to explain a simpler case first of what if you were a 2D character in, in, you know, in this 2D environment and you wanted to get to the other side of that wall, but you can't jump over it, right? But it turns out that you're actually, even though you are 2D, the world is 3D and you're stuck on a two-dimensional plane with that, within this 3D world. And you could just sidestep around the wall but how do you do that since you're like a 2D character? So you can press a button and turn the plane that you're on by 90 degrees so that now when you're moving this way, it doesn't mean the same thing anymore. It means moving along the third dimension. And so when you're further along the third dimension, you're in this PAL universe, essentially, where you can't see the wall anymore, but maybe you can see some rubble that fell off from the wall. Uh, and you can just, you know, sidestep the wall, like go, go past the wall and then Press the button again to turn back to this view where you see kind of both worlds at once and go back to the world you came from and now you know this side of the wall. Like, wow, big miracle for us is nothing, but like for this guy, it's like this miracle, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so you're, you know, like he's 2D, so he can't like move the camera out like we can and he's stuck in this plane. So when the plane turns, it looks like the world is deforming. But really all you're doing is you're taking slices, like cross sections of the world, like kind of a, like an MRI. Um, so there's this, right, there's like the, you can't see the, the, the wall at all unless maybe you're like rotated and you look along the third dimension. 
uh, and you know you you have this view where you see both worlds at once and you go back to the, the grass world and you're on the other side okay so instead of being stuck on a two-dimensional plane within a three-dimensional world what if you were stuck on a three-dimensional plane within a four-dimensional world what if there was a fourth dimension that you couldn't see so now I've pressed this button and I've rotated the 3d plane by 90 degrees so that um, when he's moving like this way, it doesn't mean the same thing anymore. It means moving along the fourth dimension, just like in the previous case was moving along the third dimension. Uh, so you can move like very similarly to this like other pal universe where there's rubble where the wall used to be and you can just walk right past the wall, right? Um, and then, you know, you'll come back to this view where you can see both worlds at once and then head back to the grass world. And that's how you go around walls using the fourth dimension. Okay. So this sounds kind of complicated sometimes, but uh, I just want to say really quickly that I've done tons of playtesting at PAX and everywhere else, and it plays like a video game. It's fine. <laughs> um, so, um, so, okay, Itai and Anna covered a lot of what I wanted to like, introduce the talk with, so that's good. I don't have to talk about this. So, but I just want to talk about briefly about this kind of thing that like, I care deeply about like, in my aesthetic for game design. So if you have a video game, you pick an abstraction level for each part of your video game. And it might be if statements or equations and things like that. And the thing with is that some abstractions contain surprising results. Like they encode more than what you based it on. Like you look at the world, you, you make this abstraction, you only look at parts of the world, but then the, the abstraction that you built actually describes more than what you uh, looked at when you built it. So for example, one of the things that made Einstein famous um, is that his theory of relativity predicted that light's paths would get bent by heavy objects. And so in 1919, during a solar eclipse, uh, they confirmed this by looking at starlight as stars passed behind the sun. Um, and so this effect is like, you know, I care a lot about this as, as a designer and games are naturally explorations and I kind of want to embrace that. And I actually like really like the like clickbait headline from the New York Times in 1919. It's like, <laughs> um, okay, so, okay, um, I don't have time to talk about mechanics design very much, but I'll just say that um, when I try to design a game, I think about, like, how much interesting consequences can I get out of simple mechanics, as simple as I can make them? And the consequences already exist, I'm just uncovering them and presenting them to the player and just letting them experience them for themselves. Um, so this talk is about like, what approaches can you take to find out what's interesting about uh, you know, 4D space or any space that your game might be um, uh, about? So when I started, um, making this game, I knew about 4D space, but more as a mathematical concept and not really as a physical space that you could move around in uh, or interact with. Um, I was, you know, trying to design this and looking for cool things that you could do, but I just didn't know and it was very difficult to just have something cool that you, uh, you know, what the game was about basically. And so I made lots of prototypes, but they weren't very good. Um, and I started, you know, doing some research and I found that, well, you know, 4D space is something that people have been thinking about for over 100 years and there's plenty of people who have written about it and I, you know, quickly discovered that one of the basic things that you could do if you could move in 4D is to just go around the wall like I just showed in the trailer. Um, so I could kind of imagine that, what that would look like if I built a prototype of that. Uh, and that seemed interesting, and so that's the first thing I tried when I made this prototype, is like make this wall level. And it worked, and it was cool. Um, and after, after I made this, I realized that I just, you know, played around with the level um, <laughs> format, and I just placed things kind of randomly. And I realized that if you take uh, this, you know, desert world, and you just add like some tiles there, then you can jump on them, and then use them to jump onto the wall, right? Uh, and that's something that I'd never read. I've never read that even to this day in a book, right? So that was pretty cool. Um, like he's gonna do it. Yeah. 
So that's the first approach, is sort of, if you think of the space of possible consequences as like a physical space, um, it means starting at a point and just really exploring it. And so like the first thing was just, oh, just you know, play with the level format, just explore different variations. But sometimes it happens even while I'm programming the game. So, um, you know, I'm trying to code this mechanic and, um, you know, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to break it. I'm trying to like find bugs with it. And I'll just stumble upon something strange. And sometimes it's not even clear if it's a bug or a feature, right? And I need to find out if it's actually a feature and then make a level about it if it's cool. Um, and another thing that might happen is I'll watch someone else play and they'll do something that I didn't even, even know was possible. And that happened a few times that I was like super exciting. Uh, and there's some levels that are based on that. Um, and I think it's especially interesting in this case because it's obviously more difficult in the case of this game because it's obviously more difficult to imagine what's going to happen. Uh, you just have to try it. Uh, and I think you know this is the reason why uh, this topic is so good to explore um, as a game as opposed to like a book or a movie. Um, so uh, the other thing I also talked about is you know if. I was reading this book called The Shape of Space, and it has this explanation of how you could bind two rings without breaking them. And by just moving one into the fourth dimension and back. Uh, and I, once I saw that, uh, I realized that I could actually implement this in game without adding any new code. Like all the code was already there. It was just like a data thing. Uh, and that was pretty exciting. Um, so. Right, like people have been thinking about these miracles for a century, but they could never really see them, only imagine them. Um, so uh, this approach doesn't really maybe apply to all games, but I think it applies to many games that are about something, right? Like if you're making Spy Party, everyone's been to a party, right? Or like maybe you're looking at James Bond movies a lot, I don't know. Um, so the third approach that I used was what I call the combinatorial approach, which is sort of laying out a grid over the space and thinking about different points along that grid. So that might mean looking at pairs of mechanics or looking at all possible shapes or position of blocks. Um, and I think you know, some representations are more fruitful than others, but it, it helps to look at mechanics not simply as arbitrary gameplay elements, but something deeper and more fundamental, like maybe looking at the math you use to represent them. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. Um, so an example that I used is if you look at uh, this collection of shapes, which uh, contains like points and circles and spheres, like that's increasing dimensions of like this sort of round shape. Um, and you know, you look at combinations, like what levels can you make by looking at combinations of those? So if you have two circles, that's the ring level that I've already shown. If you have like two points, that's two blocks that happens a lot in the game. If you have a sphere and a point, uh, in 4D you can take the point outside of the sphere by moving it in 4D. Um, and here, in the, in the case of this game, the, the sphere is represented by this temple that, uh, you know, has all its doors closed. Uh, and the point is a block, right? Uh, and then if you have, if you're trying to build a, uh, a chain, um, you know, link chain, in 4D you have to build it out of um, spheres and rings, like because two rings, they're not actually attached, right? Uh, like I showed in the, in the previous case. Um, so there's a level about that and that's pretty cool. Um, this diagonal is interesting because it's actually all the things that you can't, you know, they're, they're linked together in 3D, but not in 4D. And everything past that is things that are linked in 4D, uh, and you can't unlink even in 4D. And this works for any dimensions. And also you can make a 3D table uh, if you wanted to explore things like that. And I, I just, I want to emphasize that, like, I'm looking at broad categories, like not details of, like, particular shapes of things or, like, the size of the ring, things like that. It's just, like, kind of broadly exploring, like, what's cool about the 4D, right? Um, another example is looking at various directions um, for, uh, you know, just that the block can be along or that a level can be along. So like directions are obviously very fundamental in any game and very mathematical. 
And so the case of Minga Korea is especially interesting because one direction is special uh, since you swap it with the fourth dimension, or like you're rotating it, you're rotating and using that dimension especially. Uh, and you see like that's where the deformation comes from. It only happens in one direction. So if I just rotate the level 90 degrees, it changes the experience of, uh, that the player has playing it a lot, right? Like, and those, those two videos are the same level, just like rotated 90 degrees. Um, Right, so like one's like much faster than the other, but uh, one tells you more, kind of. So other games do this too, like I was just thinking about Meat Boy and how heavy level is like this very particular uh, thing. And I think, you know, you can look at combinations of mechanics, but I think it's more interesting or more fruitful to look at w how mechanics combine with each axis. So like if you have the, you know, the horizontal axis that's like running and, and jumping, if you have the vertical axis that's uh, wall jump or just, you know, going up and you can see how in each mechanic interacts with it and how it makes a level that's kind of interesting. It's like looking at fans, you know, moving you up or like lo looking at fans like running against them. Um, and, and I wanted to use a, an example that's not a puzzle game. So the last approach that I used uh, is what I call the top-down approach. So all the previous ones were kind of bottom-up because you were in the space kind of looking around uh, for, for something cool. But this is more like, oh, you know that, you, that something uh, would look super cool, but you don't know how to turn it into an interesting level. And that's like kind of the hardest, but the most rewarding if you succeed, I think. Um, so like the way that I think about it is sort of your, uh, if you think again of, of, uh, about the space of consequences is like you're kind of being parachuted from this airplane and like trying to steer yourself and like find like somewhere to land that's cool, but it's like really hard to do. Um, and like, I think a lot of triple A games are made like this and they only get one jump, which is why they kind of are hit and miss, maybe. Um, so for, for this case, like I think what thing that helped me a lot was expressing the cool thing in the system of the game or the mathematical representation of it and, you know, trying a bunch of representations until I find something that I, that, you know, that connects to something interesting. And uh, I had this really cool thing that I wanted you to interact with in the game, but I didn't know uh, how to make it interesting for a really long time. And I realized like once you see it as a ring, then it becomes like super clear how it's interesting and cool. And so that, that was interesting. Uh, so, okay, you I found all these like interesting consequences and now I have to present them to the player. And you don't want a player to miss what is interesting about the situation or you, there was just kind of no point in like even finding it. Um, and I think that's when the game starts needing puzzles, right? Because if the situation involves lots of thinking, then that's going to become a puzzle game. If the situation involves lots of reflexes, or you know, it becomes an action game, like Super Meat Boy or something. And uh, I tried to remove action game elements from Miyagakure because you can already see, like even in a 2D case, that you can't see the whole world at once, right? Like you're either in, in this case, uh, in you know, the grass world or the desert world, or maybe in this view where you see parts of both worlds at once. And so anything, like it just takes work and effort, like time to just move around and look around and see where things are. And by the time you know this, like maybe things have moved already. And so it's useless. And um, so that's why I try to remove um, a lot of things like that from the game or in general, make them predictable. Uh, the, the motion predictable. And also, I mean, this is pretty obvious, but like, you know, I want to explain the game non-verbally, even if it means like people are a little bit lost at first, that's okay. That's just what I feel like games should be about. Um, so, and also another note is that the space around the situation is really what's interesting, not the solve state, uh, well, most of the time. So failures give as much information as successes. Um, and for example, in Migakure, I have like some levels where you just play with this weird 4D object or like simple machine. And it, it's about understanding how to manipulate it. And I think like the manipulation is as interesting as getting the object in a particular state. Um, so here are a bunch of things I'll talk about to 
you know, present the situation to the player. So first, you know, decompose ideas. So each level is about only one single thing. And that's, you know, it's kind of unclear what a thing is, but that's like the, the, part, the, the part that you have to figure out as a designer. So if, if there are too, much, too many things happening in a level, you just split it into two. And that media career has a lot of that. Just in the obvious case of, I want to teach concepts like pushing and jumping, like wh which jumps can you do, which ones can't you do? Um, and it has like these 3D only levels that, um, where people can't really think, oh, I'm doing this wrong because of some 4D thing that I'm not understanding yet. And uh, it's just 3D, so you know if you understand pushing or jumping on its own. Uh, and then obviously, since you're like, separating each puzzle into its own ideas, then you have to think about sequences and how they teach concepts uh, uh, one after the other, or like relationships between situation, like that's the screenshot of the witness who does like pretty obviously in this sequence of panels. Uh, and the way that I approach this is I, I just made all the, like most of the puzzles, well, I make a puzzle first and then I don't really think too much about how hard it's gonna be. And then I, arrange them by all the puzzles by difficulty and then I find gaps and then maybe like fill in the gaps uh, if the difficulty ramp is too high. But just like making the puzzle just about the consequence and not about thinking about what, what the difficulty might be. And so um, my puzzle design method is to reduce the number of steps needed to complete a level like because you want to remove arbitrary steps because they're boring to do uh, and they're not about the thing that you're trying to show. Um, but also, I think it's good when a puzzle is simple to execute once you know what to do, right? Um, and so, but you also want a low chance of randomly solving the puzzle. So uh, to do that, I increase the number of possible states. So. Uh, there's lots of ways to get lost, to like do something that's wrong, and uh, then you have to reset and like do it again. Um, and you need to understand the space well enough to know what the right steps are, and there's tons of possible s state that you can be in. And it's kind of a ratio between number of steps versus like space of the puzzle. Uh, and so in the quest to remove arbitrary step and make each level about a single idea, I try to make levels as small as possible, but uh, really what matters even more than size is whether or not they can be compressed uh, in the player's head. So the tempo level is um, five by four by some height by four worlds. Um, and instead of two worlds, like in the, world the wall level, uh, but most of them are basically empty, right? Like the only the only the temple one has something in it. Um, and that makes e them easy to store in your brain. Like you just can't, you know, hold that, and that's easy. It's like as opposed to having like tons of blocks lying around that you have to avoid and things like that. Um, and that's I think like the core of what Miyagakure is about is I don't want you to move around and like look at all this stuff all the time. I want you to hold the entire level in your head because it's simple and uh, and small and solve the puzzle that way, which I think is like really thinking in 4D as opposed to just kind of moving around and trying random things. Um, so a uh, caveat to that is that some levels are so simple that um, it's really hard to make them difficult to brute force. Uh, it just makes them um, feel dirty or like too complicated for no reason. Um, so like on the right is like this puzzle from Braid that's like really simple to brute force, but it's still interesting. Um, and Miyagakure has, has a bunch of these puzzles, but it even has like extreme cases where like it's just about looking at a cool shape, like it's not even a puzzle. So like on the, on the left. Um, so, but I think if you do this and you have, if you have simple levels that can be brute forced, it's really important to build levels after that where you actually have to understand what's going on and you've built this knowledge um, to solve more complex puzzles. And that's very important to me. So uh, there's, there's, I think that there's 
some games that don't do that as much as they could. Um, so I have this simple level where you just push a block one time, once in for each direction, and uh, just to get people used to the idea, I notice something cool that happens when you do that, and I have more complicated levels that use this consequence later. And the consequence was simple, but it wasn't simple enough that players could do it at the same time as something else, and it took me a while to realize that and like split these two ideas together. Um, that said, I think many players solve problems intuitively unless they're forced to do otherwise. Uh, they just you know try random things or semi-random things like based on what seems more likely to work. And I'm totally okay with this. Um, I think those kinds of puzzles are a good way for people to just like build up an intuition of what the space is like. And um, you know they've built up this intuitive understanding, and then it you know the harder puzzles get uh, feel better because of that. And in Miyagakure, I'm kind of forced to do this in some ways at the beginning because the first levels are just about moving around in the space, and you can't. Uh, get stuck, but we, uh, you know, introduce pushable elements, and the game requires slowly uh, more and more that the player build this like intuitive model of what this uh, uh, this model of what the system uh, is, uh, because they can get stuck, so they have to think about it more, like, um, you know, more seriously. And that's often why people, when they play this game at first, they're like, "Oh, I'm I'm playing this, but I have no idea how I'm doing it." And it's on purpose, really, because that's just, I think, like a good way to do this. Um, so another thing that I think about when I make this game is starting momentum. So if you have a puzzle and then it's in a certain state at the, be at the very beginning, it sort of suggests something that you could do. And you can use that to send players and try to do that thing. And maybe like that, that's a really interesting failure case, for example. And then they, they learn, they see, oh, I see, this didn't work because of that. And then they can restart and do it uh, a better way the second time, right? Um, and I do a lot of this cheeky thing where like a level will look trivial to solve in 3D. Like if it was just a 3D level, it'd be trivial. But actually there's all this complexity hidden in the fourth dimension and you didn't you know, really expect what it was. And then you can't solve it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's why. And then you, you know, like I said, come back and, and do it better, which I think is, is super, super funny and, and cool. Um, so uh, the other thing, if you think about starting momentum is you can avoid making puzzles that send the players into a state that will be hard or impossible to get out of. Um, so because especially at first, people tend to not really think about the first steps that they do when they solve a puzzle. They just kind of try things and then things start not to work and then that's when they start thinking. So at first they just try random things. And if, you, uh, if one of the first steps was something that you know, makes them Really, that like sends them into a state that's hard to get out of, then that's like not a really good puzzle usually, unless you have to do it this way. So just something to keep in mind, and I think it's just interesting to keep in mind sort of the graph of what a puzzle uh, a puzzle is. You know, like every state that you can be in, um, and uh, like the starting point, the end point, like how far they are apart, like how big is the space, like do you go around to find the solution, things like that. So um, I want to end with um, this idea, well, you know, I've showed kind of like how I explore um, the space of, of Miyagakure, um, but I, a lot of the puzzles in this game, even if they're hard to brute force, they're only puzzles really because we can't see in 4D. Um, and I think that's like, it actually makes me really happy because I'm not really interested in making a puzzle game because I like puzzles in general. I'm really interested in the fourth dimension and just puzzles are a natural way that come out or like they're a good way to present it. Um, and it makes for very pure puzzles that are very simple and very interesting, which I, I think is very beautiful. Um, and right, like each puzzle is about trying to teach you something about the 4D from a different perspective, essentially. Uh, the important thing is the underlying system. That's it, thank you.
so much for that. That was fantastic. Uh, we've got time for one or two questions. We have Frank Lance in the back. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I'm interested in Don's puzzle idea, um, and it makes me think of uh, whether you considered uh, like a like a like a strategy game that takes place in, in four dimensions. In the same way that you know we use the grid of a chessboard to kind of structure uh, problems, you know, kind of collaborative problem solving between two players. Can you imagine? Um, a four-dimensional uh, strategy? Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean... Have you played with that, I guess, is my question. Um, thought about things that are more open-ended or... Open-ended? Yeah. Like, you mean, like, less of a goal, you mean, like... Yeah, like, instead of puzzles, like, okay, now that, imagine you have a set of players who have started to develop this ability to kind of reason and, um, and you know, intuit the world around them, how do you make that In other words, chess players make puzzles for each other. Yeah, 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 so for sure. once players get fluent in 4D, you can imagine a game like Bad Blood uh, in 4D. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen in the future, but I mean, I'm going to have a level editor, for example, and people can try like doing that. Uh, I think you could do a racing game. That would be pretty cool, actually. Uh, I'm not going to do it, though, because I'm... <laughs> done with this, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, yes, um, I was just wondering, so you set up a, like, a super interesting system where it seems to, suppose, since you have the fourth dimension, you can kind of do everything. You can take the player basically everywhere by doing, going to the fourth dimension. Hmm. So I was wondering, is this something you have to work with to make sure that there's some kind of consistency in it, that it doesn't just feel like you can, you're just always going random things as a player? Um. Okay, yeah, I think the, the idea is that the system is consistent like mathematically, right? And it's about does the player like understand that at first intuitively, and it's just like the system is there and it's for the player to go and like seek out these elements, right? And it, it's like super high detail, high fidelity, which I didn't think was possible when I started, right? Uh, and like all these things you can pick up on, like some, some of them are detailed, some, some of them are like very big, right? Uh, does that answer your question? But I guess it's also like, so it seems like you could always make a new level which seems simple and then there's something kind of completely, completely different but in every level that kind of in the fourth dimension. So, so, so you're trying to build up like a kind of, in a kind of voice, like, like there's a certain type of thing. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I use the metaphor of like splitting the fourth dimension into these stacks, okay. these level stacks, right? And so I make them look super different and that's like a help for the player to like know where they are, right? But I start to like fade that out as the game progresses. Like I showed with like the crazy shape that deforms and stuff, like that doesn't have any like layers. Um, and then, yeah, it's just like a helper thing. And yeah, it feels like anything could be there, but that's because you want them to look different for the player to really know where they are, right? Okay, we take one more. Um A little bit. Would you consider a game like Prey to kind of be like the predecessor maybe to like the fourth game? I haven't played Prey. I think it's just <laughs> portals. I think, I, I mean, I really talked about it really quickly. I think A Link to the Past is like the best predecessor to this game because it, it's like only two worlds and you only move between them by like going up and down. And this, you can have many worlds and you can also move between them using this weird view that like lets you see parts of each one. So, um, you know, and then there's crazy, crazier stuff like that's on top of that, but like that's the basic core of it, I think. Cool, thanks very right. much, Mark.